So maybe my chapter 34 will be due Tuesday because I don't think we're going to finish. we got 60 slides to get through. Today? Well, to finish it. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Ian. Not today. Maybe tomorrow. Is there a part three? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay, so we are still in protostomes, and uh, we kind of went through our platozoas and part of our loph lophotrochozoas, got through annelids, mollusca. Um, so now we're going to hit the brachial pods and the bryozoas. So again, these are both lophophores, and a lophophore is a U-shaped ridge near the mouth, and it is ciliated. And Basically, it's uh, tentacles that are ciliated. And it helps with gas exchange and food collection because that cilia will capture dead particles floating in the water or <clears throat> plankton. When we first discovered um, bryozo bryozoans and um, brachiopods, we initially put them with protostomes, but then after further investigation through anatomical and developmental characteristics. You know what? These guys actually are deuterostomes. Their cleavage is radial, so the cells are literally on top of each other. Um, and then some cell, some species um, have the anus form first, and that's, you know, that's a deuterostome. Uh, mouth forms second. Okay, so a diagram just showing the lophophore up close here. You can see it's ciliated. These tentacles are ciliated. Uh, just another example of a larval stage. Um, again, ciliated mouth. So bryozoans are colonial animals. We call them moss animals. And if you remember from plants, the bryophytes were your mosses. So your bryozoans, and zoans is the suffix for animal, uh, moss animals. So they live in colonies, and it they literally look like patches of moss on the ground. Digestive system is U-shaped, as you can see in this cross-section. The anus opens near the mouth. So here's the mouth, and there's the anus. So eats, and then kicks it out. Individual bryozoan is a zooid, and it has a tiny little chamber at the bottom called the zooceum that helps attach to rocks and substrates. So I kind of have that depicted up here. They can reproduce sexually or asexually. So asexually, they just bud off, um, and they have uh, gametes. So, okay, brachiopods, solitary lophophorites. Great example of a brach brachiopod is a lamp shell depicted here. When you look at them, you would think of them as clams, um, but the difference is their valves, another, that's another term for shells, is dorsal ventral, not lateral like in bivalves. So they're like this, and clams are like this. <coughs> so they attach to a substrate by a stock, also known as the uh, pedicel. If they don't have a stock, then they have a valve that's literally cemented to the substrate. These guys, lamp shells, are great index fossils. So I just got done teaching my seventh graders index fossils. An index fossil is a fossil that's found um, in a certain layer and only in that certain layer, and it gives you an estimate of how long ago that layer of rock was formed. So if you find other fossils, then you can date um, how long ago that fossil was around. So we use index fossils to age other fossils. So there's the pedicel right there. It's kind of used to anchor itself to some type of substrate. So. Okay, another type of solitary lophophorite is the foronoid, foronid, foronid. And uh, as you can see, kind of like I don't want to say buries itself in the ground, but it's like in the substrate. 
Uh, so it's this chitinous tube, and then they will extend out um, to feed. All right, moving on to section 34.8. No review question. Ooh, that's weird. So, so the roundworms are the nematodes, very abundant, diverse, and marine, as well as freshwater. Um, they are, a lot of nematodes are microscopic, <coughs> and most of them do live in the soil. So they say that a spoonful, spoonful of soil could contain millions of nematodes. So just to give you an idea of how small they are, how abundant they really are. So a nematode structure, bilaterally symmetrical, unsegmented, thick cuticle, they do molt, uh, shed that as they grow. No specialized respiratory organs, they use the cuticles instead to breathe through their skin. Uh, they lack circular musculature, but they can shorten, um, but they don't really change in diameter like we do with the annelids. Very well-developed digestive system, and then their mouth may have something called stylets, which is Pearson organs. Organs used to pierce, so I make sure you read up on them in your book. Okay, reproduction and development, uh, sexual with internal fertilization, and then one cool thing about them is that the sexes are different in structure, so we call that sexual dimorphism. Um, so when you look at nematodes, the male's tail is hooked and the female's is straight. Um, so we call that sexual dimorphism when males and females differ in form. The development is indirect, so the egg will hatch into a larva, and then it will go through several stages of molts to get to the adult stage. And we do use nematodes um, for genetic and developmental studies. In fact, the only organism that we have completely mapped out the fate of each cell is the C. elegans. Um, so, you know, when we talk about cell differentiation, how one cell becomes all the other types of cells, this is the only organism where we know exactly how it happens for every single cell. And there's 959 cells in that organism, and we know the fate, like literally the pathway of it. Um, so very important in research and trying to spread out to other organisms exactly how does cell differentiation work. Lifestyle, they are active hunters. They prey on other small animals or protists. Some are parasitic. Um, they can, par parasites of, of plants and animals. And every species that we've ever studied um, has found at least one parasitic species of nematodes in them. So they're just everywhere. Okay, so why do we study nematodes? Because a lot of them actually cause human diseases. Um, so there's about 50 species that regularly parasitize humans. The most serious, the trichinosis or trichinella. So they live in the small intestine of some mammals, and then the females will burrow through the intestinal wall to release their live young. Then those live young enter your lymph channels, and then they spread throughout the body, and then when they mature, they form highly resistant calcified cysts. Pinworms, prevalent in children, they live near or in the human rectum. It causes itching of the anus. Um, intestinal roundworm, not even going to try that one. 
There's one that causes a tropical disease where it lives in your circulatory system. Um, and then this one down here, elephantitis, have you guys ever heard of that? It's where your lower extremities swell and it becomes super, actually I'm just gonna show you a picture. It just, I can't even do it justice. It literally looks like an elephant's foot. This is if you get infected by it. Okay, hold on here. Oh my gosh, what the heck? Scrotal, el oh my gosh. Okay, well, I'm gonna, yeah. Really? Oh gosh, it's like everywhere. Okay, it's poor people, those poor people. How do you get rid of this? I, oops, I don't want the calculator. No. Um, here, let's find out. Treatment of elephantitis. Because now I am curious. Okay. And we'll say treatment. Looks like surgery. So you take a drug. Iver hey, Evermectin. You guys don't know what that is? No. That, that was like big in the news. I almost want to like mute myself here. I'm pretty sure, isn't that the drug that um, somebody important said that like could help you prevent COVID and everyone's like, no, no, don't do that. And then all of a sudden it actually can be used to prevent. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think they're giving people either. Okay, well, I don't know. Okay, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna turn this lecture into something political. So I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna. No! Oh my gosh! Wow, I am struggling today. <laughs> just closed my PowerPoint. <laughs> Oh, it's still there. All right, all right. No, no review questions. Moving on. All right, the final, I think this is the final section, orthopods. It's a very, very big section because orthopods are very diverse and abundant. And I keep saying very. Um, so... Orthopods are part of our ecdysozoans, which means that they go through a process called ecdysis, which is kind of how they molt. So I'm going to talk about some key features of orthopods. Um, you can definitely answer a lot of these questions in your guided notes. And then talk about four classes, which is not all of them, but just four of them, um, and some specialized features of, the, of those classes, and then some advantages and drawbacks of the exoskeleton. So introduction, orthopods are probably the most successful of all the animals, and they are the largest class. Two thirds of all named species are considered orthopods. Uh, they are very small, okay? Mostly, uh, you know, some are just millimeters in length. But they are very important to know about because they affect us in all aspects of life. They are, um, some of them produce foods for us. Okay, a lot of them are pollinators, but then the downside is that they, we compete with them for food and they can damage our crops if they you know, get out of hand. So huge economic importance um, for those insects and how they affect our lives. Okay. So here um, is just kind of a breakdown of what makes up orthropods, just to give you an idea of what kind of animals these are. Beetles, big slice of it. Then you got your flies and your butterflies and moths, bees, wasps, ants, crustaceans, so it's like your lobsters, your crayfish, okay, they belong to orthropods, arachnids, those are your spiders, yep. And then um, other orthropods, I mean, I don't even know what they mean by other, but other okay so the four classes that we are going to go through is the oh god i'm going to butcher these chelicerata the i'm just say crustaceans um hexapoda and the mirapoda so mirapoda is your centipedes and millipedes your hexa hexapoda is your insects 
uh, your crustaceans, lobsters, crabs, shrimps, isopods, barnacles, and then the chichelarata uh, spiders, <coughs> ticks and mites, or those are the big ones there. So the body plan of an orthropod is that they have jointed appendages, and this allows them to come up with a diverse way to move. Orthropod literally means jointed feet. And so these jointed appendages are not just feet, they can be other specialized structures like antennae, specialized mouth parts, um, multiple sets of legs, wings. Okay. So with the jointed feet, basically, I mean, it makes them a little bit more flexible. You know, they can extend and retract by bending. Could you imagine if your arms and legs cannot bend? Like, yeah. um, the joints here serve as fulcrum so that they have a range of, of motion. And then what they, they actually have muscles. And with the muscles, a small muscle force on a lever can make a huge movement. So. Many limbs, many functions. This is just looking at the crayfish, which you will dissect. We have sensory appendages. We have defensive appendages. We have feed-in appendages, walk-in, swim-in. Um, so this is probably the first major innovation in, in bodies of, of our uh, orthropods. Okay. okay, another thing that they have is an exterior skeleton or an exoskeleton. It's made up of chitin and a protein, so it makes it strong and flexible. What the exoskeleton does is it provides for muscle attachment. Um, so muscles can attach to the interior surface of the exoskeleton. We also have that protection. And then number three, big one, impedes water loss. Because some of these, you know, they live on land. So that crunch, when you squish a bug, you are crunching that exoskeleton. So um, as you can see with our cartoon crayfish and I think that's supposed to be a cockroach at the bottom there. Just a mosaic of hard plates that protect the uh, and support uh, the inside of the insect which is actually really really soft. So these guys their skeleton they wear it on the outside we wear our skeletons on the inside um, but their exoskeletons keep them from collapsing into soft little blobs. Okay Another thing uh, about the exoskeleton is that it's segmented, so you can kind of see lots of segmentation here. And specialized regions of that segmentation we call uh, tagmata. Um, so most of the orthropods have three tagmata, and so, but some only have two, um, but head, thorax, and then your abdomen. So your head will have mostly your sensory and feed in. Your thorax will probably be for locomotion, um, abdomen, maybe some other specialized structures. So here's what I mean by muscles attach into the inside of your exoskeleton and they work like pulleys and levers. So a small contraction can cause a huge movement. Um, so I put the little stars there to show you that muscle attachment. Okay, another characteristic, molten growth with the exoskeleton. So they, the molten is called ecdysis, the shedding of the outside layer. They use hormones to do this. Molten is actually really, really dangerous. Um, first, it's, I don't know, someone, my professor tried to explain it as, imagine trying to get out of a head-to-toe scuba suit suit and you have bad sunburn, okay? Because like, as they're shedding their exoskeleton, they can rip an eyeball out if they're not careful, or rip a limb off. So they, it's a very uh, delicate process. And what, they're not just shedding their outside layer, they're shedding everything. Like the lining of their digestive tract. Everything is shedding. Like everything. It's just, it's just a crazy concept. Um, so an orthropod, it's very easy for them, like I said, to tear off a limb or an eyeball or to get stuck. And if they get stuck while they're trying to shed their armor, they will die. So some pictures just showing uh, these insects, or not insects, sorry, these orthropods going through the molten process and they have to be very careful uh, with it. And usually when they do this, 
Um, they lay low because they are fragile. As you can see, it, they, their exoskeleton has to harden. So they're leaving that exoskeleton and they are very vulnerable, vulnerable uh, in, this, in this stage. So they have to like wait, and wait for their exoskeleton to harden uh, before they you know, resume activities. Okay, compound eye made up of the oma, omatidia, omatida, I don't know. You find the compound eye in insects, crustaceans, centipedes, and then um, extinct trilobites. But you can see they have multiple lenses and a light sensitive core called the rhabdom. Uh, so where's the rhabdom? There it is, right down there in the center. There are some insects that have simple eyes with just a single lens. So we call them a cili. So here with a, this arachnid, it's just a, these are simple eyes. But when you see this, like with your fruit fly or a dragonfly, um, it's the a compound eye. Circulatory system is open. So it flows through cavities between internal organs, uh, but not through closed vesicles. Um, movement actually helps to pump the blood uh, throughout the organism. So a diagram just comparing an open um, circulatory system versus a closed. So everything in a closed is, stays in the vessel. And here it will go into sinuses and then eventually make its way back to the heart. And we don't call the blood their blood blood. We call it hemolymph. OK, nervous system. Ganglias that run throughout the body. You'll definitely see this in the grasshopper. You will dissect. Um, but at the anterior end, which means the head, you'll see pairs of dorsal, dorsal ganglia fused together, and that's considered the brain. All right, their respiratory system is unique. They're, it's not like ours at all. Um, their respiratory system is kind of runs along their body. So they have these small little openings in their exoskeleton. And it's like separate from the circulatory system. Um, so these small little open, openings are called spiracles. And it enters the exoskeleton, and then it will travel through smaller uh, tubes so that way all the cells inside the insect or the orthropod gets the oxygen. So no single major respiratory organ like you know how we have the lungs. But they have spiracles, those are the openings through the exoskeleton. And then um, the spiracles will lead to the tracheae, and then the tracheae branch off into tracheoles. So this is, you know, the air duct, and then these are smaller air ducts that split from the tracheae. So um, I know I'm going to ask you this question later on, but I'll just ask you right now. If you take a grasshopper and you submerge just the head in the water, can you drown it? No. No, you can't because they have open-ins alongside uh, their bodies here. So if you just put the head in water, you're not going to be able to drown it. <laughs> Excretory system, getting rid of nitrogenous waste. Their system uh, uses Malpighian tubules, and it's located in the midgut and hindgut uh, junction. So in this abdomen region, zoom in. There's the Malpighian tubules. Um, and then they'll excrete nitrogenous waste.
All right, moving on to the four classes uh, within phylum Orthropoda. I'll start with the arachnids. So the red pinkish color background, or actually, I don't, I don't think I put background colors on this, did I? I just bolded the words color. So red is arachnids. Um, so they have specialized mouth parts called chichillaries, which are your, their pinchers or fangs. Um, muropods is just your centipedes and millipedes, and you'll have to know the difference between those two. Crustaceans, um, how they are biarmorous, two branched limbs. And they also have two pairs of antennae, which is unique to the crustaceans, where with the muropods, just one pair of antennae. Same with the insects, one pair of antennae, but their appendages are unaarmorous or just one branched. And another unique thing about insects is that they do have three head regions, a head, the thorax, and the abdomen, or three tagmata. Um, Okay, so starting off, um, so these are just some examples of the classes we're gonna get through. Um, so we got, I'll talk about crustaceans and focus on barnacles. Um, I'll just generalize insects. Um, some more crustaceans, I will talk about the decapod just cause you're gonna be able to dissect one. Um, and then, yeah, but arachnids are up first. So it's estimated around 57,000 species worldwide. And they have a specialized anterior appendage called the chichellarae, which I'm totally butchering, but it's their pincher or fangs located on the head. Now, another unique thing about arachnids is that they don't have like three body regions like insects do. You know how insects have head, thorax, abdomen? They only have two, okay? They only have two tag tagmata, um, and that is the prosoma and the opitho opisthosoma. So the prosoma is the anterior region, which means the head, and that is where all the appendages um, come from. They're all attached to the prosoma. So they have a pair of chichalerae. They also have a pair of pedipalps. And the pedipalps could have specialized structures like for sexual reproduction. Maybe they're just additional pinchers or maybe some type of sensory function. And then four pairs of walk-in legs are also attached to the prosoma. The posterior region, the opisthosoma, is basically just the reproductive organs. Okay, so as you can see with this cartoon diagram, they have the anterior region and then um, the posterior region. They label it differently, um, but this is the, the prosoma and the opithosoma. Same thing right here. Um, prosoma and then the opithosoma. But you can see how everything's attached to this region right here. Most are carnivores except for the termites. 
And another unique feature is book lungs, which is how they breathe. The book lungs are located underneath the abdomen. Basically, it's a series of leaf-like structures. Air gets drawn in and out by muscular contractions, and that is how they breathe. So underneath the class um, arachnids, you have the order arachnae, which are your spiders. And they are predators. They usually catch their prey in <coughs> silk webs. And that silk comes from the spinnerets. So it's formed um, by the spinnerets. All spiders do have a poison gland that leads through the chichelerae. And they use it to bite and paralyze their prey. And some are fatal to humans. Um, I'm sure you've heard about daddy long legs, how they are extremely poisonous, but their fangs are not, like they could, they could kill a human, but their fang, uh, fangs are not long enough to like penetrate through our skin and yeah, inject it into us, so. Okay, I don't want to talk about that. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they say you, you probably actually eat seven spiders in your sleep a year. Uh, no, that's just some guy. Just so what if, what if you spiders. swallow them? Yeah, what if, what if like one dude down eating down like a ton of stop. spiders <laughs> right at the end of it? I don't know. Okay, another order underneath the class arachnids is the Akare. This is your mites and ticks. Um, very, very small. Cephalophore, thorax, and abdomen. They have a round body or an ovid body. Respiration is through the body surface or trachea. They go through several distinct stages in their life cycle. They have a prelarval, larval, adult, ticks, which I'm sure you've all experienced, blood eating parasites that attach. A lot of them carry diseases. Um, so, like, you know, they carry viruses. Um, Bacteria, protozoas. If these things disappeared, nobody would If, if all of the uh, arachnid stuff, if they all disappeared, then. I think gardener snakes kind of like daddy long legs in that sense. Because like, they're very venomous, but they can't get I don't, their mouths open. Kind of. I don't know. I am. I don't like snakes. I don't, I don't <laughs> deal with them. I discovered a lot of things today. Yeah. <laughs> I had some pretty traumatic experience with uh, gardener snakes. All spiders and all this stuff. Really? Easter, oh my gosh. My cousins, Easter egg hunt. So we had this one big egg, and we used to do Easter egg hunts for money, right? So all my cousins, I got a lot of cousins, like t over 20 of them. And the boys decided to capture a gardener snake and hide it into the big Easter egg, which is supposed to be the $5 bill, right? Well, they found it, they took the $5 bill, captured the gardener snake, put it in that Easter egg. I, who, guess who found it? I did. I was so excited, opened that thing up and the thing jumped out at me. Also another traumatic experience, I was walking with my uncle in the field. I was young, I was like second grade. Yeah. Walking with my uncle in a field because we would go stripey hunting. Basically, we shoot the ground squirrels because why not, right? Okay, anyways. Um, and he found a gardener snake and I didn't see that he did. And then he like picked it up and the gardener snake was like trying to eat his finger. And then he was like, ah! And I like ran away. Like, <laughs> I thought the snake got him. Yeah, so. But order Akare, mites and ticks, and yeah, yuck, gross. Okay. Another class, the Chilopoda and the Diplopoda. Um, so your Chilopoda are your centipedes, the Diplopoda are the millipedes. So how can you tell the difference between the two? You'll look at the legs. If there are fewer legs, maybe 15, 21, or 23 pairs, it's a centipede. But if they got a crap ton, like a lot, 100, um, then it's your millipede. Another thing, another way you can tell the difference between the two is centipedes have one pair of legs on each segment, whereas with the millipedes, it's two pairs. And that's why you see more legs on the millipede. So centipedes are carnivores, millipedes are herbivores. And these guys tend to roll up into a coil if they feel threatened. Yes. Are those the ones like buying house? Probably, yeah. So 
um, here's your millipede. You can see the tiny, the two pairs on each little segment, and the centipede is just one. That's, that's I don't think anyone does. I know, like, that's Maybe, like, so yeah. your centipedes and your millipedes make up the myropods, and so these are things that they have in common. Um, a head region followed by numerous segments, and then they each bear an appendage, either one or two sets. And then the fertilization is internal. Sexes are separate. All species that we know of lay eggs. <coughs> Okay, class crustaceans. Body plans, three tagmata. Um, the two anterior one, ones fuse to form your cephalopods. Or sorry, your cephalothorax. Oh my gosh. Two pairs of antennae. They're the only arthropod that have two pairs of antennae. Three pairs of appendages for chewing or manipulating their food. And these guys are two branched um, for their limbs. Okay, reproduction of the crustacean. Separate sexes, different ways that they can copulate, but the majority of them kind of go through this life cycle where they have a, a noculus stage, and then it'll turn into an immature, and then they eventually hit the adult um, form. But that is kind of the unifying feature of most um, orders of crustaceans in this group, the noculus stage. Now, whenever you see development um, where the body plans are completely different from one stage to the next, then we, we actually call that metamorphosis. So these guys go through multiple stages of metamorphosis, kind of like your butterflies, metamorphosize. So habitats, most are marine, many freshwater, few are terrestrial. Um, I think these, the isopoda, pill bugs and soul bugs are, you know, the ones that usually make up the terrestrial ones. Copepoda, very, very small, minute, okay, small, not minute, minute. Crustaceans, abundant in plankton. So here, right here, copepoda. And probably considered the most abundant multicellular organism on Earth. Okay, so we have isopoda, your pill bugs and soul bugs, your copepoda, the crustaceans that are basically plankton. Uh, and then we have your decapods, shrimps, lobsters, crabs, and crayfish. So they're called decapod because they're 10 footed. Arachnids, they have, you know, eight. Your insects will have six. So some unique features about our decapods is that the cephalophorax region is covered by a shield called the carapace, and you'll actually, I think, have to remove that um, on your crayfish. They have swimmerettes, help them uh, reproduce and swim. And then neuropods is a flattened paddle, so you can kind of see right here. Helps them propel very rapidly and forci forcibly to go away from something or towards something. So diagram showing the decapod, which is 
can see that we have 10 appendages attached uh, to it. Your sessile crustacean are your barnacles. So they're sessile as adults, but in their larval stage, they're actually are free swimming. They kind of have these calca calcareous plates that help protect them. And then the mouth uh, is on the inside here. Separate sexes, they are hermaphroditic, but they don't self-fertilize. Um, barnacles are actually, if you think about the scale of the body to the size of the reproductive organ, they have the longest penises in the world. So when you think about scale, always. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so what they'll do is they'll just extend it and then literally just penetrate a nearby barnacle. And then, yeah. Okay, so class hexapoda, your insects. Primary terrestrial group, three body regions, head, thorax, abdomen, three pairs of legs, and they're all on the thorax. One pair of antennae. They can have one or two pairs of wings. Most have compound eyes, but there are some that have the simple eyes. So. The mouth parts are uh, diverse based on what exactly they eat. So you have insects that pierce an organism, insects that chew plants, uh, proboscis to reach down into flowers, and then fruit flies like sponging, mopping up things off the floor. Um, so. More on the thorax. The thorax can actually be further subdivided into three regions, the pro, meza, and meta. When they're in their larva stage, they don't have legs. And um, the thorax on the inside is basically filled with muscles to help operate those appendages, either whether or not they are legs and or wings. <laughs> okay, more on the wings. Insects have two pairs of wings. <laughs> um, they can fold over the back of their abdomen. Dragonflies, however, keep them erect or outstretched over time. Beetles, you may not know, but beetles, they have wings and they hide them um, underneath their kind of shell. They're like, I don't know, I don't know what you want to call it, but it's underneath. You know, so when you look at a ladybug, you're like, oh, can't fly. And all of a sudden, boom, it does fly. It's because the wings are hidden. So, yeah, they do. Okay, internal organization, digestive tracts, just a simple tube, usually the same length as the body. Um, there are some exceptions. Digestion takes place in the stomach or the midgut. Excretion, again, male piggy and tubules. Respiratory systems made up of tracheae and spiracles. Sensory receptors, a lot of them are covered in hair-like structures all over their bodies, so we call them sete, and it helps them respond to their environments. You see them a lot on the antennae and the legs. They sense sound through vibrations um, to panel organs. You'll see that on your grasshopper, but it can also be detected by the sensory hairs, like in mosquitoes. A lot of times they use pheromones to communicate with one another. Maiden signals, trail markers for food, like with ants and um, maiden signals, moths use pheromones to lure a, a male to a certain area. So, <coughs> Alright, this next slide is just comparing the tympanum to our ear canal. So we sense vibrations and it knocks on these three bones. They sense these vibrations um, and it just travels to the inside. 
And then finally, life histories. Uh, they go through metamorphosis. Each stage is different. Um, the immature stages are called nymphs, and then it will reach that adult form. There are two types of metamorphoses that you need to be aware of. Simple means that the stages are quite similar to adults, like grasshoppers. Uh, complete means that they look completely different in each little stage here. So you go with egg, and then we have our larva, and then the pupa, and then the adult. We're here, they're just like somewhat miniature um, sizes of the adult forms. There are a lot more orders that your book mentions, but we're not going to dive into. If you ever take an entomology class in college, it's actually a pretty fun class. And a diagram just showing the, the uh, diversified mouth parts. <laughs>